We are here, as I said, because it's 10 years of the NSF funding, and so I want to tell you a little bit where we come from, kind of the history of CBMM and where we are going. Um, and uh, I want to also to remember and thank all the students and postdocs, staff, faculty, that has powered our scientific adventure over the last 10 years. CBMM started with a vision that I, I personally share with many of my colleagues, and this is um, a vision that has shaped my scientific career. I always believed that the problem of intelligence, and especially human intelligence, is not only one of the great problems in science, but is, I think, personally, the greatest of all. And we can argue why, but that's my personal view. And so, um, and so CBMM was kind of an embodiment of this vision, and uh, um, it was 10 years ago with Josh Tenenbaum and others, we realized that things were starting to change and managed to get funding um, for um, trying to understand intelligence by leveraging uh, new contribution from, uh, from uh, the, these areas of cognitive science and computer science, machine learning, and neuroscience. And we wanted to create a new, a new field, science of engineering of intelligence, dedicated to developing a computational understanding of human intelligence. Now, I want to tell you about the people who were involved um, that started this. The trigger were, was Raphael Reif. It was Raphael Reif, who was then provost at MIT, who came to BCS, to our department, and challenged us, uh, trying to come up, tell us to come up with some new research vision for BCS. And then Mirgan Kassour, who was the chair of the department, then uh, su suggested to Josh Tenenbaum and myself to try to do, to meet the challenge. So what happened was that together we started what we called an intelligence initiative, and we had a very successful workshop at the American Academy with all the faculty of MIT and were kind of impressed how many that were interested in the fundamental problem of intelligence. Um, and after that, we distributed some funding um, that Mark Kastner, the provost then, the dean of science at the time, um, made available. And, uh, um, but then what happened was uh, that there was uh, 2011, 150 years of MIT birthday, and there were five symposia organized for that. So we organized a, one of the five symposia, and we call it Brains, Minds, and, and Machines. And this is, was the proposal we had for that symposium that was accepted in 2011. And then uh, was, this was very successful. These are images from the past that I'll uh, let go as a slideshow. You recognize, uh, several of you are, uh, recognize themselves, <laughs> maybe a bit aged. Um, it was, it was impressive how, how many people came and were enthusiastic about it. The first day that we call the Golden Age was included Marvin Minsky and Noam Chomsky. First time they met together in a, on a podium. <laughs> and uh, other people like Seymour, um, uh, like Sidney Brenner and uh, Patrick Winston and Emilio Bizzi and uh, and so uh, the last day was a marketplace for intelligence in which we had IBM and Google and Microsoft and, uh, and uh, um, Demi Sassabis, Amnon Shashua, Kobe Richter, and so on. This, there was enormous interest. And so on the heels of this, we made a proposal to NSF, convinced them that it was the time to do something. And one of the people were 
were really too instrumental in, in this part of the story, so getting funding from NSF and formulating the principle of CBMM uh, were, was Patrick Winston, who died, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. He was, um, he was a great mensch, and uh, we're really missing him, but I wanted to acknowledge his contribution. Now, we had a, a lot of great students and postdocs and faculty over the last 10 years. Um, yeah, there are people from NSF, you have seen it, John Cousin and Dragan, our wonderful advisory committee, faculty. Don't try to memorize everything because it will be run in the break again, so you can check it and reinforce memories if you want. Um, but our research uh, was turbocharged by all the great people we had, and we ended up with what uh, Philip uh, referred to quite a, a trail of published papers. And we had collaboration in a number of institutions and also with uh, um, academic, um, non-academic outfit companies like uh, DeepMind and uh, Mobi Intel through Mobileye and, and so on. Um, and the next slide shows uh, some of our Research. It's difficult to speak about research for 10 years among so many different great people, but um, as Philip mentioned, there were, we are about seven, 800 papers, and uh, it's not so much the number, but many of them are very um, important um, milestones and results and uh, progress in the science of intelligence. So our research plan in the first five years was really about uh, trying to make progress on some of the broad questions you can ask about intelligence. You can ask how it develops, um, what is the hardware of the mind, you, the circuit, so to speak, the equivalent of transistor end gates, you, what is the connection between vision and symbols, and uh, also added a theory trust, um, this trust six, trying to think of a theoretical explanation that would glue these different um, but related projects together. And uh, uh, there was a set of seed projects in uh, audition, decision, phase recognition, that uh, were important for injecting new blood in the center and uh, uh, opening up new areas of study on different aspects of intelligence. The development effort in the meantime has become um, a separate major project led by Josh uh, and uh, thanks to the generosity of David Siegel that will join us later. Now, for the second five years, we try to address uh, uh, the, uh, an amazing ability of human intelligence, the fact uh, that we can answer any of an infinite number of questions about uh, the surrounding visual environment without any pre-training. This is cl closely related to what really is a very um, useful illusion, is the, the one that I would call like um, the visual equivalent of cogito ergo sum, I would call it video ergo sum, is something like visual consciousness uh, that you experience uh, when you are in an environment and can uh, move around it and, as I said, answer any questions about it. And uh, some of this comes from a neglected part of vi human vision, which is in the next slide, gives a glimpse of it, is that we really see at any one time only a small part of the image. And what, what we really think we perceive in terms of the surrounding is uh, a computation, an illusion fabricated by our brain, of course, very useful. And this kind of uh, 
in the last five years, we pushed uh, an architecture for vision, next slide, that uh, shows uh, how one could address um, the different parts that this kind of uh, uh, visual consciousness will require. Here is a, essentially a list of papers um, just to give a feeling for the many topics we have uh, worked on and uh, uh, the results we got. And the next slide shows uh, for the different modules in that uh, previous slide, you see some of their papers. What we have done is uh, on the science of human intelligence, we have uh, um, show that some deep neural network systems are surprisingly accurate models of the mechanism of uh, visual cortex in primate. And uh, on uh, um, the theory side, we have uh, developed uh, a theory of invariance in visual object recognition and also shown the deep networks, but not shallow networks can um, escape the curse of dimensionality, can lead to uh, feasible computations, uh, unlike shallow network. And then in the science of, of uh, human development, we produced the uh, first step of a computational models of infant core common sense knowledge. And, uh, and then on the engineering side, um, CBMM investigator demonstrated that compositional neural networks enable robots to better and more efficiently generalize to new scenarios. So this is uh, the past, now the future. So uh, where do we go from, from here? And I want to reflect for a moment um, about exactly the past and, uh, and ideas about the futures. So in the past year, we expected that progress in the science of, of intelligence to be also have an effect in engineering. And this happened. Um, you can ask why one example is that some of the success stories in uh, the last 10 years take, for instance, uh, um, uh, DeepMind, AlphaGo, playing playing Go better than human champions, or chess, or other games. Um, and Mobileye, which is um, uh, Amnon Sashua, and uh, there the problem is uh, a system that is an intelligent driver, like humans can be. And uh, they both, both this uh, um, success story are based on algorithms reinforcement learning and deep learning that have their roots in neuroscience or cognitive science. Um, reinforcement learning is work uh, um, by, by um, Hebb and others, and deep learning is really work by, um, by originally by David Huber and Thorsten Wiesel recording from the primate cortex of cats and monkeys at Harvard, they provided the basic hierarchical architecture that is uh, still what deep network are using today. So in fact, um, we should continue to try to understand human intelligence. And the main reason is, of course, what I said already, is the greatest problem in science. So, but then there are also, you know, long-term applications that you can think. And this, the one listed here, kind of science fiction, but, you know, not so much. We may want and may um, be able to expand our intelligence, our memory at some point by more directly interfacing with machines. And, uh, of course, in order to do that, you need to know what are the protocol of communication, where to put the, the plugs, and so on and so forth. But, um, but there is something else, which is uh, looking around how the situation is today, is that for the first time in, the, in our history, the history of mankind, 
we have other systems in addition to us that pass a Turing test. And so I'm thinking about GPT-4 or so. You, we can discuss how really intelligent they are and so on, but I think the Turing tests are conceived by Turing um, is, you know, can be, is passed by this, by this system. And so, so um, the, the, um, there is a, a wonderful opportunity you know, these are some of the system. We have the human brain, of course, but then we have transformers, and maybe some of these other that are um, reaching uh, levels sufficient to be helpful to humans, say in programming, for instance, uh, in writing, and uh, in general, I think it's in some vague sense are Turing intelligent. Now. The fact that we can study and compare our human intelligence with these systems, um, we can look for similarities and differences. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for a comparative study of intelligence. Are there common principles or not? And I personally believe there are. Um, it's a question whether there will be Many, like in physics, like conservation of energy or uh, of mass, or just a few, like in biology, like the helical structure of DNA. That's to be, to be found out. But um, I have um, a number of reasons to believe that there are, um, there are um, fundamental principles, fundamental in the sense of physics. I don't want to because of time to bore you about to one such potential principle, uh, but just say that this is a, um, a wonderful opportunity that we have. And uh, you know, this suggests a kind of uh, strategy for research in this era in which we have AI systems um, that is comparing kind of the cognitive level, comparing uh, them with each other and with human intelligence about what they can or cannot do, potentially going more in details, trying to understand the differences between the circuits, logical circuits, some more simple instantiation of the behavior, just looking inside transformer and inside brains, and ideally coming up with some theoretical fundamental principles. So you can ask, why do I need a theory? OK, here I want to make a little story, this story about Alessandro Volta. He was professor in Pavia, and he was made count by Napoleon 1800 uh, because of the discovery of the pila, the battery. It was an accidental discovery, and he did it for a typical um, academic motivation. He wanted to show that a colleague of his, Galvani, was wrong. So, but the point is that, um, that um, this was the first time there was a source of continuous electricity in the world. Until then, electricity was sparks. And with Volta, suddenly there was continuous electricity so people could study it and within a few years the whole electrochemistry was done there were electric generators there were electric motors uh, Volta himself uh, designed the telegraph line between Pavia and Milan 30 kilometers away which was not built but he designed it information until then was going at the speed of a horse after Volta speed of light so it was very important and uh, and uh, there were so, a lot of applications, even if people did not understand how electricity worked. There was no theory. And that's the point I want to make. Uh, so it's only 60 years later that Maxwell appeared. At that point, there was a theory of electromagnetism. And of course, we, we, the, the evolution of electricity um, grew exponentially in terms of computers and uh, um, the internet and the AI and so on and everything in between. So this is just 
to say that th that's one reason we want to do theory. And next slide shows uh, um, other reasons. For instance, if we would understand how transformers really work in detail, we could have uh, really an explain how transformers work. And not you know this deep explainability of large language model is one of, of the big problems these days for applications. Um, so this would be a side effect of a theory of these um, intelligent machines. I want here just to say that uh, there are uh, many fascinating questions, but I think uh, um, in the race for intelligence, we should push for science rather than short-term engineering. Um, you know, we, I say, as academic researchers, it's fine that companies do the engineering. It's important, it's useful, but um, I think developing um, some fundamental theory of learning and intelligence is uh, a compelling and urgent need in, uh, in this panorama of other intelligence appearing around us. I don't think we want them to tell us how our brain works, which is not impossible. Now, let me pass to the next step, which is, you know, we know uh, that we have genes and we have memes, ideas. And uh, the evolution of mankind is due to the evolution of memes as much as to the evolution of genes. And so, as Richard Dawkins was saying, the common aspect of both the genes and memes is that they replicate. They mutate and replicate. And so the way memes replicate is um, unlike uh, DNA and so on, the main um, engine there is, uh, um, you know, in part, in, especially in the old days, maybe even today, um, Educational institutions like uh, big university had a key role in um, uh, replicating and spreading memes. And uh, so I think CBMM has been trying to do the same. The research part is mutating the ideas, improving them. And, and then there is the part of dissemination of the education, uh, outreach, tech transferred. And so, um, and so that's a turn out to free of these other things, in addition to research, important that CBMM has done. One is uh, uh, education efforts. You know, Ellen Hildreth is not, she's not with us today, but, and uh, Susan uh, took up the uh, duties from Ellen is here. Thank you, Susan. You know, there, was, there is a great um, education hub that we have developed. Ellen has developed, and Susan, with uh, online courses and organization between various institutions for teaching courses on the science of intelligence. And then, then uh, the outreach effort Mandana was in charge of and uh, um, she could not be here, but she has sent a video that we can show now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mandana Sassenfer. So I'd like to uh, uh, give you an update on what we have been doing in the last 10 years, trying to uh, diversify the, uh, the science of intelligence and the field of computational neuroscience. We wanted to increase the number of women and minority in the field. 
and we needed to bring students who are usually not exposed or don't have access to computational neuroscience into this field. Uh, so what we decided to do was to have a quantitative method workshop to expose students to the skills that they needed. And then the next step was to bring those students for 10 weeks to MIT, place them in CBMM labs, and really have them do some research. Uh, we also had academic partnership with some of the minority-serving institutions that worked very well. We had collaboration with MITx, which basically in 2014, the first year we had CBMM, uh, we created an online uh, quantitative methods workshop, which to date is offered and has about uh, two or 300 students every semester taking the class. The workshop, for the past 10 years, in total, we had 70, 726 participants from 15 uh, participating institutions. Most of them were minority-serving institutions or urban uh, schools. And 90% of the students who attended were either female or uh, underrepresented minority or both. And 121 of those ended up also going to uh, the next step, which was summer program at MIT or in the CBMM. For the past 10 years, we had 144 funded slots, but of those, 124 were unique students because some of them came back. And then of those 124, 109 have currently graduated from college, and of those, 59 are in PhD program or finished their PhD. Uh, some did MD-PhD, a few did master's, some are in medical school, and a number also are software engineers. At least eight of them have received NSF, GRF. One was uh, a Soros fellow. At least two have had Fulbright, four had uh, Goldwater, and probably the numbers are, these are under estimation. We have 13 students, and the reason why I'm showing you these 13 students, they are all in PhD tracks, but all of them at MIT. And, and we can go and, and show you more. I said 59, there is not enough space for 59, but these are some of the students, just to give you an idea of the diversity of, of the students we have. I also mentioned that a number of students decide to join the workforce. And, uh, and so the students that we have here uh, have done quite well. So it's important for, for CBMM to actually, the outreach to really uh, work, to have our students come back and actually uh, teach in some of our workshops. So this is really a way to build a community that gives back. Just as important is the partner that we have at our institution for broadening participation. Uh, we couldn't do this without having people on the ground who are actually committed as much as we are on the other side. So for example, this is the group at Hunter led by uh, Susan Epstein. This has been a fantastic kind of collaboration. Here is a, a, a faculty, Dominic, who is at, at Howard. So Dominic was not there at Howard when CBMM started, but he's now the most uh, important faculty that we work with uh, for CBMM. These are three faculty in Puerto Rico. And again, we work with two or four campuses. Uh, here we have a partner from uh, University of Central Florida and great partner at Florida International University. And again, this is why uh, our outreach uh, works so well. We also have to depend entirely on the faculty at CBMM. And if we didn't have committed faculty who actually did what they needed to do to make this outreach successful, it will not work. So what do they do? They give lectures at the workshop, they, uh, they give lectures at the, uh, during the summer, they host students, they have roundtable discussion, they talk to them about their career, and it's really an inspiration for the students. Tommy had three summer students in his lab, and all three of them are actually currently uh, graduate students. And this is uh, two students that uh, Boris and Andre mentored. One of them has already graduated uh, with a PhD from MIT, she's currently at Facebook, and the other one decided to just go in industry right away. We also have, you know, an example of, for example, two postdocs here who mentored a student in Bob Desimon's lab. She's now in a PhD program, but Diego here is also going to start his own lab. So now I just want to shift gears because the workshop at, with our partner institution is very important. This is a way for us to really broaden the participation, and we have really concentrated on Puerto Rico because that's where we think the need is, is, is bigger. This is really what I want to focus on because that's also what we hope to continue in the future with some money from, from the uh, uh, NSF supplement that we have received. The idea is you train some students and then they train other students and you basically you know, expand from, from there. We work both with the teachers because what we realize is that students are not prepared for mass when they, they leave high school. So one of the uh, now initiative is to really train teachers, high school teachers, in teaching math and machine learning, introduce them to this, make this really uh, easy uh, set of, of lectures or, or material for them to use. 
and then uh, you have to partner with the education uh, director in the country. Finally, I want to thank Tommy and, and, and others for this opportunity to be a part of CBMM. I'm a biologist and biochemist by training who didn't know anything about AI and I have learned so much in these 10 years and it has been a pleasure to work with uh, these people. I really want to thank Ellen Hildred, which has done a phenomenal job both at the workshop and with all the education uh, curriculum that she developed. And I want to talk to also thank Joel Oppenheim, who, who has always come to every single CBMM poster session at the end of the RU and talk one on one with the CBMM students to help them uh, navigate you know, their future. And finally, I want to thank Kathleen and Chris Brewer, who work be behind the scenes. I mean, we have a great website, thanks to Chris. Uh, I'm talking to you right now because Chris is videotaping me. And then Kathleen, who is behind the scene and has made this CBMM, you know, uh, just a pleasure to work with. Thank you.